So, today we will uh, uh, discuss uh, issues in uh, scaling uh, gate oxide. Okay. Now, first we will address SiO2 scaling. We will uh, see that you know silicon oxide has been uh, fairly good insulator on silicon, probably the best insulator semiconducting combination that one can uh, find uh, in the nature. But we see that there are now issues in uh, using silicon oxide in a uh, transistor structure, right. We will uh, uh, take a look at that, uh, uh, you know we will also talk about uh, the reliability issues of gate oxide. Okay. In particular, we will uh, look at two concepts, uh, one what we call FN tunneling. That is to say, if you start applying higher and higher voltages on silicon oxide, that is start increasing the electric field, at some point you will start uh, conducting through the silicon oxide. And that phenomenon is called FN tunneling, which is essentially an abbreviation called Fowler-Nordheim tunneling. Okay, so, we will look at that and we will also uh, study uh, what is meant by TDDB okay, which stands for uh, time dependent dielectric breakdown. Okay, so then let us uh, get started uh, with the uh, uh, you know understanding the silicon oxide and uh, you know what issues are we talking about here and uh, you know when we look at silicon and silicon oxide this SiO2 we say is thermally grown. Okay. What it means essentially is that uh, you know uh, you subject the silicon wafer uh, expose the silicon wafer to high temperature okay such as you know greater than let's say 900 degree centigrade okay and uh, expose it to oxygen ambient okay and this would result in conversion of silicon into silicon oxide you know that is what we call uh, growth of silicon oxide as opposed to depositing something on top of silicon oxide right we actually convert uh, silicon into silicon oxide as you could well imagine at this interface there is a transition what we have in silicon is that we have a nice covalent bond structure okay it's a uh, crystalline semiconductor as you know and silicon oxide is an amorphous material okay and uh, essentially you know what you have uh, in silicon oxide is essentially silicon bonding to oxygen right. So, you know you have S i uh, is essentially bonded to oxygen okay? and this will essentially continue on right. Uh, in other words you know this there will be another O and silicon and O and silicon and so on and so forth right. Okay. So, that is what you have in other words an oxygen atom is shared between two silicon atom right. So, that satisfies the valence okay. and hence a silicon atom is bonded with four half oxygen atoms which is essentially a SiO2 you see. But this is not crystalline you know this is really you know very irregular right it would not be looking like that. But the point is that every silicon oxygen o atom will bond to an oxygen atom and this is how you have a structure in silicon oxide in bulk silicon oxide that is that is when I start growing oxide on top of silicon as I go deeper and deeper up thickness is increasing. Essentially you see a very ideal silicon oxide structure where you know silicon is bonded to oxygen which is in turn bonded to silicon and you have this mesh okay. But at this interface you see you have a transition right you are transitioning from one material to another material right and this is what is extremely cru crucial in the context of uh, field effect transistor okay and uh, the issue at this interface is that uh, 
you know you have two important uh, aspect here one is what is called interface traps okay and the other one is what is called oxide charges sometimes they are also called fixed oxide charges okay you know they are sort of denoted as qf to say this there is some charge which is fixed it doesn't change and you have what is called interface traps okay and typically the inter when i say qf the typical unit that we are talking is you know coulomb per centimeter square you know mostly we talk of per unit area okay and uh, we also sometimes refer to the number of traps fixed traps in the oxide which is essentially number per centimeter square okay and when you multiply this with q you get qf okay that is uh, essentially transition from number to the uh, charge okay now similarly you have interface traps uh, interface traps are typically denoted as the interface trap charge is denoted as qit okay the traps themselves are denoted as nit okay which is exactly at this interface whereas these oxide charges are little bit away from the interface right this is where you will find qf and this is where you will find qit qit is exactly at the interface okay and that is the distinction essentially okay and as you start going away then the oxide is fairly ideal you know there are no charges in an insulator you know all that is fine okay and qit as opposed to fixed charge can be either negative positive right and that depends on whether you are populating holes in the channel or electrons in the channel okay whereas qf is always fixed it doesn't change and in the silicon oxide system which is charged inside the silicon oxide qf is always positive okay and it is conjectured that qf arises at this interface because when you go little away from interface because you still don't have an regular oxide structure in other words more importantly it is conjectured that you have a mix missing oxygen atom in that region okay so this is also called oxygen vacancy hmm? okay because this is transitioning from silicon to silicon oxide so it's not quite sio2 it's siox where that x is less than 2 right in some places you have missing oxygen okay and it turns out such a defect what it does is that it loses an electron right because now there is no oxygen there is one electron here and one electron here it loses one electron out and it gets positively charged hmm? and this is what is uh, supposed to give rise to all the positive charge that we see in silicon oxide at very close to this interface okay and this is fixed because this is little bit away from the interface what you do in the channel has no bearing on changing this because you cannot have these carriers go in and change its state that is why it is called fixed. On the other hand at the interface what happens interface state is presumed because at the interface let us say there is a silicon atom sitting here this silicon atom is bonding to a silicon atom here a silicon atom here as is shown a silicon atom inside down here but there is a missing silicon here okay and in fact this is what we call dangling bond. Okay. If the silicon were to continue up you will have another silicon atom sitting there and you know it is a perfect covalent bonding mechanism. Okay. But here you know you will have lot of these uh, missing silicon atoms exactly at the interface where the silicon is sitting at this interface but it has failed to find another silicon atom here because it is oxygen rich it is silicon oxide right and hence that gives rise to interface state. Okay this interface traps and oxide charges they can make or break your device if you have very large amount of interface traps and oxide charge there is no way you can build a field effect transistor this is the precise reason why even though we had known about field effect transistor theory way back in 1930s a field effect transistor on silicon was only formed in 1960s because it was very difficult to create an oxide which has very low fixed charge very low interface state charge the technology was not mature at that time. 
that is why the first semiconductor transistor was a bipolar junction transistor right it was 1947 but then as the technology progressed we came up with lot of techniques to make sure that the oxide which is grown on top of silicon is very high quality oxide which has as low missing oxygen as possible so very low oxide charge and as few dangling bonds as possible hence very few interface states okay today you know in fact in the state of the art uh, cmos technology the numbers that we talk about for nit is less than 10 power 10 per centimeter square and similarly for nf okay number per centimeter square is again less than 10 to the 10 per centimeter square you see this number does not make much sense unless you put this in a perspective. Okay, what is that perspective? Let us recall that the silicon atomic density right? it is about 5 into 10 power 22 per centimeter cube hmm? that is per centimeter cube of silicon you take start counting the atoms you will count so many atoms right? that is the atomic density of silicon. Now, just a 0th order calculation for you if this is my silicon, silicon if it were infinite in all dimensions okay, then everywhere you go you have this atomic density volume density, but when I cut silicon uh, when I make a silicon wafer at the surface you see this is a silicon surface huh? this is where I am going to grow oxide build devices here we do not talk of volume density here instead we talk of aerial density correct because now it is a plane huh? because there is nothing else on top of it to talk of volume density. Okay. So, just a 0th order way of getting the aerial density from a volume density is essentially take this number 5 into 10 to the 22 huh? 2 thirds of it okay, is your aerial density you can go back and think about how it is two thirds okay but you know take it for granted from uh, you know it's a 2d we are looking at instead of 3d okay and hence it's two thirds of that number okay so if you do this math what you get is 5 this is now per centimeter square correct okay so this is approximately 10 to the 15 per centimeter square Mm. Now, you put things in perspective what is it telling you if you had this silicon surface which is a silicon wafer at the surface you will have so many silicon atoms mm, and obviously, you will have so many traps because all these have dangling bonds because they have failed to get a silicon on top. Okay. So, this is your surface trap density. Okay. And you could bring this 5 into 10 to the 15 to 10 power 10 per centimeter square that is 5 orders of magnitude decrease is possible because we put silicon oxide on top of silicon. Okay. That is why even though it is not silicon on top of that surface we say silicon oxide is an excellent passivation layer. what it means is that when I grow silicon oxide the silicon oxide silicon chemistry the interface chemistry if you will is so nice that silicon oxide can saturate so many dangling bonds okay, and really bring down the volume I mean the surface trap density by at least 5 orders of magnitude in today's devices. Okay. So, that is the kind of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, achievement that we have. But this is just simply not possible if you look at other semiconductors like gallium arsenide. You put an insulator on gallium arsenide you will struggle to get anywhere close to 10 power 10. It could be 10 power 12, 10 power 13 you know depending on what kind of uh, insulator you have. Same with germanium oxide if you want to use germanium for making field effect transistor right. And the worst thing about germanium oxide is germanium oxide is water soluble. Okay, let alone 
be strong in resisting various chemicals that we use during semiconductor processing. After growing germanium oxide even if you wash your germanium vapor it just dissolves germanium oxide right. So, the key then for the insulator in FET structure FET insulator that is gate insulator is that it should uh, withstand first of all harsh processing because after putting oxide as we have already seen in a CMOS flow we have so many processes it should withstand all those process conditions and give very good interface property ok and this can be done with silicon silicon oxide and uh, it is just impossible to do it with any other uh, you know means and that is why and again you know uh, we, we take lot of care in really achieving that right. For example, silicon wafer has to be cleaned ok, it has to be cleaned using various chemicals. We have now a cleaning procedure called RCA cleaning ok, it is a very well established uh, chemical cleaning procedure wherein uh, silicon wafer is put in acidic and alkaline uh, solutions to get rid of all kinds of contaminants metal contaminants organic contaminants and so on and so forth right. Cleaning is extremely important ok and then oxidation at high temperature Im is important you know during oxidation you need to really have a very clean ambient you need to have a very high quality quartz furnace in which you can actually do this oxidation ok. So, oxidation at high temperature and in clean condition. And then of course, you know you have to immediately put the gate electrode and then we have also figured out immediately after oxidation it always helps if you also anneal it in inert ambient like nitrogen. You know if you anneal it at high temperature it improves the quality of the interface ok. And then once you make all your MOS capacitor put the gate we also do what is called uh, forming gas anneal. Forming gas is essentially a mixture of nitrogen plus hydrogen about 90 percent hydrogen and 10 percent nitrogen and 10 percent hydrogen. The idea here is that you know you have these dangling bonds most of them are passivated by oxygen of silicon oxide, but there still could be some remnant dangling bonds. If you expose it to this kind of an ambient hydrogen is a very light material and very reactive material it can actually come in diffuse in and if there are any dangling bonds which look like this hydrogen can come and terminate that ok. And that is the idea of uh, you know doing this forming gas anneal right. Way back in 60s or even before that we did not know all these tricks. It took a while to really come up with all these process development technology development and today we have very standard recipes. You use these recipes you are guaranteed to get oxide charges less than 10 power 10 per centimeter square. If you have those kind of charges you will have very little effect on threshold voltage. Your threshold voltage will not deviate from what ideal theory would predict. Otherwise these oxide charges themselves will influence your threshold voltage very drastically ok. So, <coughs> this is why we started using uh, silicon oxide. But a lot of things have happened in silicon oxide uh, you know in terms of our very early MOSFET way back in 1960s ok which were still large channel MOSFET like 10 micron 20 micron kind of MOSFET. They used to operate at 10 volt and their uh, typical gate oxide thickness of, of the order of 100 nanometer ok. And today we talk of 1 volt supply voltage, but oxide thicknesses of the order of 1 nanometer. You see something interesting here this is exactly what I had said in the context of scaling theory also constant electric scaling field theory says you keep electric field constant, but if you see the history electric fields have increased over generations and that is very evident voltage has decreased by 10 x whereas thickness of the oxide has decreased by 100 x ok. If you were to say the electric field is approximately Vg by T ox ok, 
which is V g here 10 volt. You do 10 volt by 100 nanometer you get an electric field which we typically represent in mega volt per centimeter 1 mega volt per centimeter that is the electric field. And today if you talk of 1 volt across 1 nanometer the electric fields are 10 times large 10 mega volt per centimeter. This is precisely the reason for uh, you know uh, concerns today on uh, silicon oxide ok. And of course, the breakdown strength of good quality silicon oxide breakdown strength meaning at this voltage instantaneously it will break down you know is of the order of 18 mega volt per centimeter. Uh, this is still much higher than 10 mega volt per centimeter, but as we will see little later there is a phenomenon called time dependent dielectric breakdown under which even if you have lower electric field below the breakdown so called breakdown strength you can still have an oxide breakdown over long time that is why it is called time dependent breakdown ok not instantaneously whereas 18 mega volt instantaneously you have a breakdown ok we will talk about that uh, in a while ok. So, you see uh, uh, first of all you know in terms of computing electric field across the oxide this is an approximate exp expression you see really the electric field should be given by as you can very well understand V g minus V f b remember V f b is like a built in voltage there is already that built in voltage due to the fact that the gate work function and substrate work function are not necessarily the same that gives rise to this built in potential which we call here V f b ok minus V silicon. What is V silicon? It is essentially psi s the band bending because remember I, I already talked about this simple model that is you have C ox C silicon and you apply V g. This V g drop across C ox which is called V ox and drops across silicon which is called V silicon. So, in a series circuit as you can see total V g is equal to V ox plus V silicon ok. So, your electric field across the oxide is V ox by T ox correct. So, your V ox in turn is V g minus V silicon by T ox, but because there is this uh, built in potential as I was telling you there is a V f b term also right. So, this is the exact expression that you should always use whenever you are asked to compute the electric field ok. Uh, so, the key here is that it turns out this electric field is very important as you start increasing the electric field something interesting starts happening. In fact, you can start seeing significant current through the oxide, oxide is supposed to be an insulator which is true when you have low electric field. But at high electric field just as you have a lightning and air is a insulator supposed to be, but you can have the current passing through this medium which is supposedly insulated because you have a very high field generated. And so is the case with silicon oxide also under low field electric condition it is indeed an insulator, but beyond certain electric field it can start conducting ok. And let us look at uh, that particular aspect and understand uh, how does uh, uh, silicon oxide conduct ok. Let us take uh, uh, for instance a uh, case where you know I have uh, <coughs> uh, it is true whether it is n type or p type ok. So, uh, let us let us take uh, uh, any one of uh, these conditions let us take uh, uh, n type ok and uh, I have this S i O 2 and I have gate gate electrode right it could be let us say polysilicon uh, n plus or p plus if it is a p channel transistor that you are going to build you will put a p plus silicon or you could also have a metal gate it does not matter some conductor is there on the gate ok. Now, let us look at this system ok and let us uh, consider a case uh, when I apply a positive voltage I mean just for simplicity let us say I just take a metal electrode right I put aluminum electrode. Uh, it does not matter what electrode is just uh, let us take that condition. So, what happens when you start applying positive voltage as you can see here positive voltage will start accumulating the more and more electrons here correct that is the accumulation condition a negative voltage will drive away electron and it will create an inversion condition ok. Let us now consider a positive 
VG condition. So, if you look at the band diagram under this condition, what you will uh, see is the following, right? You have an insulator, this is a psi O2, okay, and this is your gate, okay. This is uh, the gate that is aluminum gate, and this is your SiO2, okay, and here. this is n type it is accumulating here more electrons at the surface because I have applied positive voltage and accordingly the Fermi level on the gate is lower than the Fermi level on the substrate that is indicative of that this voltage is positive with respect to this voltage. So, the band bending will essentially look like this correct. There are a lot of electrons here in the channel which is here as you can see, but these electrons cannot go in because oxide as you know is an insulator what does it mean there is a huge barrier here which we have computed earlier which is greater than 3 electron volt that is a large barrier. So, oxide you know this uh, uh, carriers will not tunnel through and hence you have 0 current. Let us now consider a case when V g starts increasing more and more positive what happens when you start applying more and more positive voltage essentially what you have is that you know these two Fermi levels start separating okay that is the in the difference between this Fermi level and this Fermi level is the applied voltage and larger voltage will also set up larger electric field which is not difficult to understand and if you recall our discussion may be in the first or second lecture electric field is always related to gradient in band diagram. Remember this, okay, right? And more precisely, one over Q d by d. Right. So, what does it mean? What is the gradient in band diagram? This is a gradient in band diagram, correct? d e by dx. If I go to larger voltage, larger electric field should set up. In other words, my band bending now will look like this. Okay this is a condition for larger electric field what will happen now is correct this is how the band diagram will look okay this is the difference between this point and this point which is same as this this is the difference between this point and this point which is same as this what has happened in the process is i have separated this fermi level from this fermi level by a larger voltage and there is a larger gradient this is de by dx which is your electric field right more electric field increase it further okay you will have even more electric field something like this now there is something very interesting happening if you can see here earlier these electrons had to surmount this barrier to come into the oxide to conduct current. Now, if you continue to increase this further and further, let us say you have this kind of a situation very large electric field. Now, you see something interesting here there is an electron sitting here and it sees an allowed energy state here which is separated by an extremely small distance. What is this distance that di distance is governed by electric field larger the electric field I have more very severe band bending and smaller is this distance and when this distance comes to of the order of nanometers then you can have large tunneling current electrons need not go over the barrier electrons can easily tunnel through this so called triangular barrier. Okay, right. So, if you increase it further electric field this distance decreases tunneling distance increases it turns out that tunneling current is an exponential function of a tunneling distance. If you decrease the tunneling distance by a small amount there will be an exponential increase in tunneling current right. Then you will see that your tunneling current starts going up exponentially with applied electric field or applied voltage. Okay. 
and this is exactly what is called FN tunneling. Okay. <coughs> For example, when will this tunneling distance be 1 nanometer? Just to tell you this uh, which is not very hard to understand right. Uh, you know this let us say if this barrier is 3 volt 3 electron volt then you should have an electric field which is 3 volt per nanometer. Okay. If you have an electric field which is 3 volt per nanometer you will reach this point which is in line with this point over a distance of 1 nanometer. Huh? So, those are the kinds of field that we are talking about that is when the tunneling will start right. Typically it turns out you will start tunneling even before you reach 1 nanometer 4 nanometer 5 nanometer you know you, s you easily will start seeing uh, significant uh, uh, tunneling current and we typically say that if the electric fields are more than you know of the order of uh, 5 to 6 mega volt per centimeter okay, uh, then you will uh, uh, certainly start uh, seeing uh, you know significant uh, tunneling current ok. Hmm. So, what is this electric field? This is 6 into 10 to the 6 ok mega right m here and centimeter ok which is uh, how many nanometers right 10 to the 7 hmm? right 10 to the 9 nanometer is a meter and 10 to the 7 is essentially you know uh, this. So, in fact you can see here that right it is essentially 6 by 10 ok which is 0 0.6 volt per nanometer right. So, even when you reach 0 0.6 volt per nanometer what is 0 0.6 volt per nanometer for 3 volt barrier to be aligned here you have a tunneling distance of 5 nanometer you see 0 0.6 times 5. So, typically when you are tunneling distance is of the order of 5 nanometer uh, you will start seeing tunneling current ok. So, this 6 mega volt per centimeter really corresponds to 0 0.6 volt per nanometer which approximately corresponds to a tunneling distance of 5 nanometer tunneling distance approximately. Uh. Okay. And this is what you see if you were to look at current density J okay, as a function of electric field E. Initially your current is very 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 small, okay. but once you start reaching the fields that I was talking about 6 mega volt kind of field you know you see that current starts increasing this being a log scale you see this is a linear line meaning it is an exponential increase with respect to increasing electric field ok. And in fact, when you reach 10 mega volt per centimeter this is E in 10 mega volt per centimeter your typical tunneling current density in silicon oxide silicon system are of the order of 100 ampere per centimeter square. Okay. That is the kind of current density that uh, we will see. Hmm? Okay. The 100 ampere per centimeter square number may look huge, but you need to put things in perspective. Let us say if you have a uh, you know 1 micron uh, square area for your transistor or a gate area is 1 micron square, okay. then you can see that what current you will have. right? No, you, you are sent 100 ampere per centimeter square okay, and you are talking of uh, 1 micron square. So, this is 100 into 10 to the minus 8 correct okay. and you know that is the kind of current that you will see which is about a micro ampere current. Okay. But that micro ampere current is now significant in the context of the transistors that we are talking about okay. and if you continue this further it continues to increase. And if this is really very large you know what is that large of the order of 18 mega volt per centimeter. 
again this number may vary depending on how good is your oxide have you done an excellent quality oxide or it is little bit inferior it may be little better than 18 or little less than 18, but that is a approximate range ok. At this point you see a huge current you know as soon as I go to that voltage I will instantaneously have a very large current it will result in thermal runaway and your metal can melt and it will cause a permanent short in the device ok. So, that will be a destructive breakdown. But even before this destructive breakdown, this is really destructive. Okay. Even before that, you can still have reasonable current flowing through the oxide, it is no longer an insulator in this electric field regime. Hmm? That is the main message that I wanted to you know convey to you, right. Uh, oxide can conduct if you have a uh, sufficiently large electric field and that is because of this tunneling process. And in fact, it is called Faulnordheim Nordheim tunneling because they were the first uh, to really you know sort of give the theory for such tunneling. And in fact, you can reasonably uh, calculate this tunneling current reasonably well using this expression which is called Fowler Nordheim expression. This is E is electric field here and you have this exponential of uh, various quantity let me just uh, uh, write it down for you this is m ox which is a effective mass of electrons in oxide ok ok and ok where uh, your a is essentially an Fn constant which is again given by this expression 8 pi h phi b. Here E is this electric field that we are talking about. You see this exponential dependence on electric field ok ok and this is negative because which essentially means that as you increase E the current here uh, increases this is in denominator you see ok. And uh, uh, E is electric field which is obvious, Q is charge okay, and H is Planck's constant okay. and uh, what else do we have? Uh, uh, M ox is what is called effective electron mass in oxide which is lower than its free mass, free electron mass ok. And phi b is important quantity and that is called barrier height ok. This phi b is barrier height and what is that barrier height? At that barrier height is essentially this that we are talking about. This is phi b. Hmm? Larger the barrier, lower will be the current so, that is not again hard to understand because there is a huge barrier for the uh, carriers to conduct ok. Smaller the barrier higher is the tunneling current ok. Again it is an exponential function of barrier height. Similarly, given a barrier height for example, silicon silicon oxide system barrier height is fixed. Then you start changing electric field again it is an exponential function of electric field ok. So, using this expression you can uh, very well compute uh, the tunneling current density ok. And uh, now let us look at uh, you know the other uh, uh, important uh, ok. The, the important point again I want to stress is that the oxide uh, current through the oxide is essentially dependent on the field across the oxide and the barrier height. Uh, whether injection is from here to here or here to here ok. If the same barrier height exists and same electric field is there, the currents will be similar ok. In other words, they are independent of from which side the current is coming into the oxide. But what is crucial is the barrier height and electric field. In this co context, it may be uh, useful to sort of mention here uh, the difference between n channel and p channel transistors ok. Uh, remember uh, n channel transistors have 
p type substrate okay and n plus polysilicon and they are mostly operated with positive gate voltage correct hmm. that is we are interested in this kind of a tunneling we have a positive voltage when you invert this transistor with the positive voltage there are a lot of electrons and these electrons can actually tunnel through ok. So, the barrier height here for electrons tunneling is what is important. Now, if you look at a p channel transistor you see this is p plus polysilicon and it is operated with negative gate voltage. Huh? When you apply negative gate voltage I also create lot of holes here right. I also create lot of electrons here and these electrons tunnel. Now, you can have two possibilities right one is tunneling of electrons from p side if you are only talking of electrons tunneling right because this is negative electrons have to go in this direction. But turns out this may not be very significant for two reasons first of all it is p plus semiconductor. So, availability of electrons itself may be less, but more importantly the barrier height now when we talk of barrier height you know it is the electrons sitting here these have to tunnel into the oxide this is a huge barrier height now ok because not electrons sitting in the conduction band we are talking of electrons sitting in the p plus layer right. So, that is why this electron current is less and there can be hole current, but again the barrier for hole injection is larger if you recall our discussion when we sketch the band diagram of oxide silicon I told you that the band offset for electrons is of the order of 3 electron volt whereas, for holes it is of the order of 4 electrons volt at the bottom right. So, as an effect the leakage tunneling leakage current in P MOS could be less than tunneling leakage current in N MOS ok. So, that is J leakage due to tunneling remember we are not talking of sub threshold leakage we are talking of tunneling leakage huh? ok is essentially for p mos typically is less than n mos that is because of these considerations ok. So, at least <laughs> this is one region where you, you p mos uh, would help you a little bit uh, it would not uh, conduct uh, so much leakage current uh, through the gate oxide ok. Now, let us talk about uh, this issue of time dependent dielectric breakdown <coughs> ok. We said that if your electric field is greater than 18 mega volt per centimeter there is instantaneous breakdown But let us say that E is less than 18 mega volt. We do know that even when E is less than 18 mega volt per centimeter, there can be conduction. As soon as I go more than 5, 6 mega volt per centimeter, we said that there is a fallen order time tunneling current because tunneling distance has come down to 5 nanometer of that order, correct. So, in other words, if you look at the band diagram of the oxide what you will see is you know again let me just consider the case where you have n type on the silicon and I have applied uh, you know positive voltage on the gate ok. And as I have already told you this band bending will essentially you know increase and will result something like this correct eventually mm. this right ok. Now, it is less than 18 mega volt, but still there is tunneling because this distance is less than 5 nanometer after order of 5 nanometer now. So, what happens really now is that these electrons come into the oxide conduction band there is large electric field they get accelerated because of the electric field you know it means that their energy increases, but they can essentially collide with silicon uh, atoms uh, and they can they can lose their energy ok. 
and they can go through a series of these processes and eventually they are collected at the anode from cathode they are coming and collected at the anode and that constitutes a current for you. Okay. But what can happen is that these electrons which have high energy when they impact with silicon oxygen SiO2 silicon oxygen bond they can actually break the bonds. Okay. In other words these high energy electrons hmm, in SiO2 okay, can break SiO bond. SiO bond has certain strength if the electron energy is more than that strength and it collides with that it can break SiO bond and in other words it will start creating defect in SiO2. Hmm? Correct SiO2 which was ideal now starts seeing lot of defects okay? and in fact, we also call this over time these defect starts increasing and this is also referred to as in literature oxide wear out. You know just like any mechanical device wears out over long usage you know this oxide over long usage is wearing out you know slowly the bonds are breaking in the oxide and you know. Uh, what happens because of that is that you know once you start breaking the bonds these are defect sites okay you know they do not necessarily are like insulating materials you can model that as you know there is some defect here and you know this defect is propagating something like this depending on how the bonds are getting broken okay and this is what is called a percolation path okay eventually you know what happens is that this along this path there is more and more electric field there is some kind of a positive feedback more carriers can go in okay. and eventually you can reach a breakdown condition you will have a path a defective path from anode to cathode which is not really an insulating path. In other words if you look at the top view of the silicon oxide this is the silicon oxide that I have and this is the silicon material I have right this is the gate silicon oxide and silicon right. So, there is this electrons going and you know they are going of course, in all direction, but anywhere here a weak spot starts wearing out okay. and eventually in that spot you know there could be a defective path from the gate to the substrate or anode to the cathode and hence you have a destructive breakdown under that condition. So, what it means is that although I had very low electric field which is much lower than the breakdown strength over the time because of the oxide wear out oxide will break down. In other words if you actually look at as a function of time current gate current or oxide current okay, you will essentially have some current uh, which is small current as detect dictated by fuller nordheim tunneling theory given an electric field there is a current okay you know this current continues like this but over some time you know you will see an effect something like this you can see a huge current flowing in and this is what we call time to breakdown tbd huh? So, even though I am operating the transistor at a normal operating condition which is much lower than 18 mega volt per centimeter 1 volt across 1 nanometer is 10 mega volt per centimeter approximately huh? because you need to do V g minus V f b minus V silicon by T ox, but it will be very close to 10 mega volt per centimeter. Okay. So, even at 10 mega volt per centimeter which is the normal operating condition of the transistors to in today's chips with silicon oxide as a gate dielectric over time it will break down. If you apply larger electric field this will break down even earlier if you have a lower electric field this will break down much later. Okay. So, this is why it is important to characterize the so called oxide reliability. Okay oxide 
is insulator it is a good material, but over time it breaks down does it break down in 1 year 10 year. You cannot of course, wait for 10 years to figure out uh, when does it break down right, because even before you ship the products in uh, the market you need to make an assessment of the breakdown uh, of the oxide breakdown time of the oxide. In other words, it is called a reliability prediction. Uh, so, the way the reliability prediction is done in all these devices is through what is called accelerated testing. Okay. So, what it means is the following right. Uh, let us say okay, I am looking at V across the oxide or V g what that you apply on the gate as a function of lifetime. Let me call it as tau L which is a lifetime of the device. Hmm. And this is really going to operate at let us say 1 volt hmm. that is the condition for let us say 65 nanometer or 45 nanometer CMOS technology. But for this 1 volt it may survive for 10 years, but I cannot wait for 10 years before I ship the product in the market. So, what I do in the fab once I make my device is intentionally apply large electric field much larger electric field than the device will ever see in the field. Okay. So, instead of 1 volt I may apply 5 volt let us say when you do this this is what I mean by accelerated testing the breakdown time breakdown times come down very drastically which is manageable you can do the measurement in the lab you do not wait for 10 years for that. Okay. So, you figure out what is the breakdown time okay. maybe do it for a few different voltages do it for 6 volt. 5 volt and 4 volt and so on and so forth okay. and based on that you do what is called an extrapolation for used condition. In other words what you have really done this is the real test at high fields. In other words I accelerate the deterioration and get the trend of it is lifetime dependence as a function of different voltages which are very high and I assume that the same phenomenon is valid even at low voltage the wear out phenomenon and try to do an extrapolation and say look if you are going to use this device in the field now this device is going to survive for 10 years or whatever you know you get some lifetime and this is what is called uh, lifetime prediction. So, I do the test for a month or so because you know I may engineer this voltage such that you know the whole data should come to me in a month okay. this lifetime may be month this may be 2 weeks a week or whatever it is right. So, based on that I can now do this extrapolation and this is how this uh, lifetime prediction engineering is done in foundries. Okay. Uh, this is an important exercise and the point again to summarize is that even though oxide has an 18 mega volt instantaneous breakdown field it breaks down instantaneously at lower breakdown field which is an operating voltage condition it will still break down over a long time and what is that time is to be estimated using this time dependent dielectric breakdown measurement okay and there are there are various techniques that are used to enhance the reliability of uh, silicon oxide you know uh, you know silicon oxide reliability is typically very thin silicon oxides also uh, are annealed uh, in either ammonia or nitrous oxide this is actually called nitridation. Hmm. It is not quite silicon nitride, but you first create a silicon oxide matrix uh, if you anneal it in nitrogen nitrogen is very inert you cannot really react nitrogen with silicon, but ammonia or N2O if you expose the silicon oxide after a oxidation process then some of the sil SiO bonds can be replaced with SiN bonds and that is why it is called nitridation okay. and it turns out silicon nitro silicon nitrogen bonds are much stronger than silicon oxygen bonds and hence they can sustain larger electric field. Okay. And the other 
there is also other uh, model that is used to explain the enhancement of the breakdown field and that is essentially when you grow silicon oxide on silicon, silicon oxide always have compressive stress. Okay. When you put some convert some of the silicon oxide into some SIN bonds it is called silicon oxynitride. Okay. This is called a nitridation this is actually called CIOXNY where x is very close to 2, but not quite 2, okay. y is little more than 0 okay. and that is why it is called SiOx and y or it is called silicon oxynitride. Hmm. It turns out nitride typically has tensile strength, tensile stress. Okay. So, you when you put cell convert little bit of oxygen oxide into nitride you reduce the compressive stress right that is another theory. So, you minimize the stress if the bonds are under stress it is easier to break the bonds if you reduce that stress it is more difficult to break those bonds right and that is another theory which is also uh, proposed to explain the fact that when you do the silicon oxynitride you have enhanced reliability. Hmm. The point that I am again trying to make is that the silicon oxide has been used maybe up to 65 nanometer kind of silicon technology. Okay. After that we have made a migration to uh, high k gate dielectric which we will discuss in the next class next lecture and when we were doing silicon oxide of the order of 1 nanometer it was really silicon oxynitride because it is so thin reliability is a concern we were actually converting part of that oxygen silicon bonds into nitride nitrogen silicon bonds. Okay. Very very small nitrogen by the way. The nitrogen that we were introducing were maybe 3 to 4 atomic percentage. Okay. Specifically at the interfaces, two interfaces because that is the key because the damage starts occurring at the interface. Right? You really need to strengthen the interface. Okay. So, thereby uh, you know we have been uh, using this uh, silicon oxynitride until very recently before we made a transition to high k gate dielectrics. So, let me summarize then uh, silicon oxide first of all is an excellent material because it passivates the traps at the silicon silicon oxide interface which we have already seen okay. and that is why silicon silicon oxide system is an excellent system to make FETs unlike germanium or gallium arsenide system that is why silicon has simply displaced all other semiconductors in the industry more than 90 percent of your electronics which is available in the commercial domain is silicon electronics that is because of FETs and that is because of silicon oxide. Silicon oxide has really served us for you know almost 5 decades from 60s till you know very recently yeah, that is a very large uh, service that it has provided. But over the time because we scaled this from 100 nanometer to 1 nanometer we started having these reliability problems first of all also follow Nordheim tunneling which induced uh, you know this uh, breakdown time dependent breakdown and so on and so forth. And next lecture we will also see there is another phenomenon called direct tunneling that is even more serious okay. and because of that now we are talking of replacing silicon oxide with high k gate dielectrics. Right? So, with that uh, let us conclude the lecture today and uh, in the next uh, lecture we will uh, start discussing about direct tunneling in silicon oxide, ultra thin silicon oxide and why do we need high k gate dielectrics to replace silicon oxide.